professor of world religions and spirituality at SMU's Perkins School of Theology. With those introductions given and with the start that we've had together, let's do a bit of definitional work. So Ella and Ruben, how do you think hearing and listening are similar and different? Okay, um, so when I think of hearing, I initially think of just basically hearing what's coming in, the words that you're hearing, and I think listening moves past simply hearing the words that are coming in. To me, listening is looking for deeper meaning as well as looking or lis hearing more than just the words. It's looking at body language, um, tone, it's much more, and trying to find a deeper meaning and understanding behind what a person is saying. I think listening takes more effort than simply hearing because anyone can hear. It's just letting sound come to your ears, I feel like. But listening is looking for deeper meaning, looking, hearing past simply the words, and trying to really understand what the other person is saying. Thank you, Ella. Those of us who uh, grew up in the 60s, I don't see anyone here. Oh, there's, thank you very much. <laughs> maybe familiar with, or maybe even, uh, uh, th th there's a song by uh, Simon and Garfunkel called The Sounds of Silence. And there's a line there that says, people hearing without listening. And so that stands out as one uh, example of the fact that there is a difference between those two. And what is the difference? I'd like to uh, address that with a uh, little quote from a uh, Jewish philosopher whom I really admired and I learned much from, Martin Buber, who wrote a book called I and Thou, and he talks about a tree. Before I continue, sorry for uh, this uh, elongated uh, response to your question, I checked about listening to trees and I found some uh, interesting YouTube videos and also uh, a lot of, I mean, some websites about some people learning, uh, li listening to trees. They got, uh, they, uh, there's a uh, British young gentleman who was taking his master's degree in design and he had this idea of trying to see what was in a tree, what he could hear in a tree. So he devised a, a learning, de uh, a hearing device that would put uh, a, uh, put uh, the end of it on the trunk of a tree and then he would listen. And you'll be amazed at the kinds of things that he, he heard. And that was really uh, a discovery for him that the tree is not just stolid standing there and so on. It's full of life. He could hear the water flowing. He could hear the gushes of the different uh, movements within the tree and so on. So try it. Check this out on YouTube. Uh, listening to trees or tree listening or something to that effect. In any case, that already indicates, well, he's listening and then he heard. So it's a little reverse from the way uh, we may use those terms. And so this uh, philosopher wrote something that struck me way, 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 way back when I was still uh, a graduate student myself. He wrote in this book called I and Thou about a tree. He says, I consider a tree. I can perceive it as a movement, flowing veins on clinging, uh, uh, flowing veins, pressing uh, on clinging, pressing path, suck the roots, breathing the leaves, ceaseless commerce with earth and air, and the uh, uh, and, uh, and growth itself. I can classify it as a species and study it as a type in its structure and mode of life. In all this, the tree remains my object occupies space and time and has its nature and its constitution. But it can, however, come about, if I have both will and grace, that in considering the tree, I become bound up in relation to it. The tree is now no longer it. I have been seized by the power of exclusiveness. So in the words of Martin Buber, then, it's listening is your stance of wanting to open yourself to the tree, but still the tree becomes an object to you. You can analyze it, you can uh, take pictures of it, or you can describe its shape and so on. 
But there may, become, there may come a moment when you're before the tree that somehow it strikes you. The tree is no longer an it before you, but somehow you get absorbed in its very being. Now, you might want to call that a, a mystical moment, but it's not that kind of mystical moment in terms of esoteric. I feel that that's something that can happen to us all the time. If we have that stance of listening, you might just be able to hear something that could transform us. I have a lot more to say, but I think that's enough for now. Mm. But thank you. So oh, it's, it's really reversing the two in the way that Ella used it, but not that uh, the one is mistaken or the other is uh, better, but that these, are, these two are interchangeable, and so when we use them in context, at least we know what we're talking about, that there's a surface way of letting the sounds enter, but it doesn't register. And so what ha what's, what's, what's important here is for us to have that second part, that second aspect, whether you call it the art of listening or the grace of hearing, Whichever word you use, I think that they can be uh, interchanged as long as you know what, what you're referring to. Thank you. So as we work with the definitions that are being offered, which clearly are many and varied, you, like if I were to give the microphone and pass it throughout the audience now or invite people to write to me, it's likely that others would have additional ideas about what is the difference what is the resonance of hearing and listening? However we decide to define that, my sense is that we're talking about connection in some way, that at some point it moves beyond this notion of something mechanical that happens because we have quote unquote ears to hear, but something else takes place. I might call that listening for the sake of giving credence to this event that we're calling the art of listening tonight. And as I'm thinking about that, I'd love to hear from Augusto and Margot about how did you learn to listen? And as you think about that question, if you were trying to teach someone else to listen, what would you say to them? It's funny when I, I reflect on um, myself as a listener and, and how I learned to listen. I was a very shy child. I was a painfully shy child. Um, but funny enough, I was always blessed to have these very loquacious, outgoing friends. Um, that's just how my life has always been and I think continues to be. But as a child, um, I was always called a good listener. My friends always called me a good listener. Family relied on me as a good listener. Um, I was labeled a good listener, but I think I was just called a good listener because I was a quiet child. Um, I, I took in a lot and rarely offered anything in exchange. Uh, maybe a wondering, maybe a prompting question, um, but rarely any advice or any wisdom of any kind. Um, and still yet was often called like uh, a counselor. Um, and uh, I think that hearing that again and again in life, uh, I got to a point where I decided I would go work on my master's in counseling. And while I was uh, earning my master's in counseling, I, I think that was my first time actually thinking of listening as a skill, a thing that you have to actually do, that there are things that you do when you listen, not only how you hear a person's words, how you watch their demeanor, how you... Uh, listen through what they're saying, um, but also how you receive it, your body language, your tone, how you're communicating that you're listening um, and the way that you respond in that listening. And I think that um, seeing listening as a skill, something that could be learned, something that, that I could do, it, it suddenly became this big, bigger thing. But it also opened up the idea to me that I needed to learn how to communicate. I've got to start speaking more. And as I began to look for ways to uh, develop my voice, share my voice, empower myself with my voice, I found that the more comfortable I became with speaking, the worse listener I was. Um, suddenly, I was getting better at sharing my thoughts and ideas, and all of a sudden, I was not the great listener that I used to be. Um, and so if I was offering advice to a person who was looking to grow as a listener, it would be 
that listening uh, takes dis it's, it's discipline. It takes patience. Uh, it takes intent. Um, it takes patience. Um, it takes focus. It is uh, focusing on like why am I listening in the first place, and also discipline and patience. <laughs> Well, I, I, I think I've been trying to learn how to listen, I think, for 50 years, because I was the opposite of you. I was not a very good listener. Um, and you'll have, Marcus, you'll have to ask my wife if I've learned anything in the 50 years. I will do uh, that. I, I will say I was, always, I was a kid who always had the answer and was quick to tell you what it was. Um, but early on in my career, um, first job, I've had the same boss for 50, 25 years. And very early on in my career, he sat me down and he said, look, you, you're really smart and you've got great ideas, but you need to shut up. You need to wait. You need to, I want you to do me a favor from now on. In any meeting you're in, in any phone call, before you say anything, I want you to take five seconds. Just five seconds. And I will tell you, early on, five seconds felt like an eternity to me. I could not, I was dying to get the word out. And what I learned by taking the five seconds is I could observe what the other person looked like, what their eyes were doing, what their body language was doing. Maybe they had something else they wanted to say. They weren't done. Um, I could get perspective on where they were coming from. And the moment I became a much better listener, I learned that I could, I could communicate better. I could actually do a better job of convincing people what I needed them to know, even if, even if it was my objective to convince them that they were wrong. I might do a much better job if I just listened to them trying to tell me while I was wrong first. And uh, it was a skill I had to learn. It was something I had to constantly work on. It's something I, to this day, keep working on because when you, you get to a certain age, you really think you know the answer and uh, you gotta stop and, and take the time. And it's, it's something I continue to work on to this day. It's not a, it's not a one-time learning event. It's a lifelong learning event for me. Shall we test your five seconds? We could do it. One. I will tell you that in recent years, I've become fascinated by, uh, by someone uh, who goes by the name of Thich Nhat Hanh. And when he describes the practice of being present, he explains that presence is a gift for the self. I want to say capital S, self, as well as for others. He says that mindful listeners can create the space for others to empty out their hearts. He goes on to say that even when we might perceive that that person is misunderstanding something or is just wrong-headed, deep listening is what aids us to continue to listen to that person with compassion. Because in that moment, if you're really listening to another person, you're not listening just for yourself. You're listening for them and trying to understand. You're not necessarily trying to respond. So if any of that resonates, Ella and Kendall, I'd be interested in hearing you reflect on why you think listening and or deep listening might be rare. Uh, uh, hello? Okay, sorry, I just tested out. So um, I'm gonna go off of deep listening, and I think that when I think of deep listening, I think of someone that listens in a way where they can kind of shift their perspective and kind of like change their mindset and kind of push away all their biases and judgments and kind of just find a way to fit into the perspective of others around them. And I think what makes it so rare is that there are only so many people that can do that and that have the, like, the skill to do that because in order to deep listen, you have to be willing to just put away your own opinions and what you would respond to someone else's problems. And for example, in my friend group, I'm one of the friends that just kind of sits back and like listens to all my friends' problems. 
But um, one thing I've learned is that when you just listen to people, especially deep listening, you have to make sure that you're just taking it in instead of saying what you would think or instead of bursting out your own opinion. And so I think that's kind of why it's rare is because so many people, especially nowadays on controversial topics or other things like that, I think we, like a lot of us, have the urge to just say what we think and say our perspective instead of actually listening to the others around us and trying to dig into their perspective and their mentality. So that's what I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would completely agree with that. I think deep listening is so rare because most of the times, especially if it's on something that we disagree with, we start th immediately start thinking of a rebuttal as soon as we hear something we can respond to. Um, we try, and like a lot of times, there isn't a lot of silence in the conversation. As soon as someone finishes their point, the next person already has something to say because they've been thinking about it during the other person's speaking. Um, so I think sometimes it's actually beneficial for there just to be a moment of silence so that while the other person is talking, you are actually able to listen to what they're saying without constantly be thinking of a rebuttal or something you can say. And this allows it to be a conversation rather than a debate because when you're only thinking of what you can respond, the conversation doesn't really go anywhere because the other person's perspective isn't really being considered. So it seems there's been this movement from broad definitions about hearing and listening. And in that exchange, it was, it's not something mechanical. Let's move to something about connection. And now we're moving into this deeper skill set that is, so what do we do with this connection? And in some ways, it moves us into a contemporary moment, yet before we get there, let's look back and hold multiple things in tension, perhaps. So in the historical novel, A Tale of Two Cities, Charles Dickens was assessing the relationship between Paris and London during the French Revolution when he wrote, and you may know this, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. This famous quote, it goes on to describe the significant contrast in people's lived experience across and throughout the English Channel. But what might be most remarkable for me about how that particular tale of these two cities shows itself is that there doesn't seem to be any voice or any room for experiences that aren't the extreme opposites. Here's some more quotes to prove my point from that same first paragraph of that book. You may not have heard these, but they may sound familiar to you. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. So you get my point. The extremes are happening. It was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. And as much as that tale was set back in the late 18th century, I think the observations are really remarkably relevant for right now. Extreme points of view seem to hold much of our attention these days. And the result, at least in this American society, is that we feel compelled, even obligated, to choose sides in politics, in friendships, in social circumstances, even in family. We seem to gravitate toward the poles. So Kendall, Ella, and Ruben, I'd like to hear your reflections on your sense of the current divisiveness that is a part of American society, at least. And where do you think listening has a place in all of that for the present moment, as well as perhaps for the future moment? 
So as you think about the perhaps divisive times that we live in, at least in this country, where does listening fall in that? And does it fall differently in the future than it does now? Okay, well, I think, especially in, in political circumstances or things like that, it seems that listening doesn't really happen a lot of the times because people are so set on their own opinion and unwilling to listen to others that they don't try to listen to the other point of view because they immediately assume they won't agree with any of it, it's completely wrong. And so the listening kind of becomes obsolete and people only start focusing on their point of view and how they can prove to the other person that they're correct. So I think listening needs to start taking a bigger role in society, especially when it comes to political issues or social issues um, where society is greatly divided. I think listening and truly trying to understand the other point of view will be very helpful for our country. Um, I agree with Ella a lot, um, and I definitely think that sometimes in more controversial topics like politics or a lot of the um, racial violence that happens now, like Black Lives Matter, and I mean, there are like a lot of others that are happening in Asia too, like Muslim Lives Matter. Um, but I think with those, sometimes we're so fast to take sides and we already have this bias within us that we kind of just say, oh, I already know like that the other side of the uh, whatever, like the argument is going to be wrong, in my opinion, is right, or something like that. So I think that listening, especially in today's society, is important because it allows us to kind of find a way to communicate our ideas with one another and our cultures and religions because when we can listen to each other, we get the opportunity to um, kind of navigate the perspective of others. And mm -hmm. with um, a lot of controversial topics, I think it's really popular, kind of like Ella was saying, for people to shut down um, others feelings and what they're trying to convey so I think definitely in the future if we want to keep moving forward in society and become unified um, even more than we are now I think it's going to be important to listen to one another and try to understand each other thank you I agree very much with what Ella and Kendall said and uh, well, my day job, which I enjoy very much, is teaching about different kinds of religions to students for Christian ministry. It's, this is at Perkins School of Theology at SMU, and so those who come are preparing to become pastors in different churches somewhere uh, in the southwest area, or some of them are also international students who will go back to their countries and pastor Christian communities and spread the love of God in whatever they are doing. But my task in my job is to present how other religions also have some things that we can learn from. So for example, my own uh, uh, background uh, uh, enabled me to encounter Buddhism. So what I offer will be some ways in which Buddhists have come to a uh, way of life that is very peaceful and wise and compassionate. And so anyway, one of the uh, required assignments for this course is that each student should go out and meet and interview a person of another religious tradition in depth twice and then visit their center of uh, worship or center where they have services and so on and write about their reflections on the interview. And what I get from these reports is the fact that they get to interact with their uh, interviewees no longer as an object that they're trying to learn from, okay, what does your religion say about this or that, but they find out they're human just like me and we can be friends and so on. So it's that 
way of relating to another human being that somehow can move us and make us realize there's something I can learn from this person. So, um, and I'm sure that that also we can apply to politics. So to interview somebody of a different political stance and just ask what makes them tick, why they believe that way without prejudging, but to be able to listen. And what happens to my students is that friendship in many cases lasts. And there was an instance of one of my students for the ministry who interviewed a graduate student who was Muslim who came from Egypt and so uh, uh, several years later, while well, they continue to communicate, several years, years later when the uh, graduate student at SMU who was from Egypt returned to her country and got married, she invited her friend, uh, the pastor, and uh, the pastor who, uh, also went over there and uh, celebrated their wedding together. So it's that kind of friendship that can happen and enable us to really be able to live one another and embrace one another and then we talk about our differences, not in, a, in, in an inimical way, but in a way that we can share from what we have learned and perhaps be moved along the way to see that there are other perspectives than what I bring to the table. So it's that kind of experience that I have been moved by a lot in uh, the students' reports, in encountering another on the same level as human beings and becoming friends. So without doubt, there is celebration for what listening has the power to do. I hesitate to use this word often because it may lose its power, but if I'm hearing correctly, there is this message that suggests that listen, listening has the ability to transform us. If we allow it to, it has the ability to transform us. As much as that might be true, I also think listening might have its limitations. So as we move to a closing of sorts, I'd actually like to invite Augusto, Kendall, and Margot to share with us any wisdom that they have about what listening cannot do. When you think about the power of listening and all that it's offered to us, even in some of the comments that have been shared tonight, and you think of your own experience about what listening has the ability to do, what do you think the limitations are? What can it not do? Um, I think that listening, it can't say your opinion. Like when you listen to someone else, you're taking in their perspective and you're absorbing knowledge from them and what they know. So I think if you're just listening and you're not doing anything else like putting in your input or giving them more advice, I think your only job is to absorb more knowledge and it just can't let you say your opinion and you don't have a response. And I think that's something that comes with being a good listener is knowing the limitations of listening and that it's not just always saying something in return because I could be listening to someone and just think, oh, so that's what they think, here's what I think, and then tell them what I think. And then how Ella earlier was saying how that conversation just continues, I think listening, if you're really just deep listening and you're not doing anything else, I think you shouldn't be able to say your opinion or really have a response. I, I, think, I think the most important thing really is, uh, and the big differentiator is, and I tell us, I used to tell us to my girls all the time. I hope they could answer this question the same way. But um, the only way you get any value out of listening is if you go to the next important thing, which is understanding. So every opinion anyone has, even the most divisive political opinions, are rooted in a belief inside them. And there's a reason why they feel that way. They're not just saying that to say it. They're not evil people. They're not difficult people. They say it because of their upbringing, because of their background, because of experiences they've had, because of things that have happened to them. 
Uh, and until you actually go beyond listening to understanding where they're coming from, you can't affect any change. Because I can have a conversation with someone, and even if I'm truly, deeply listening, if I don't try to really understand where they're coming from, nothing inside me changes, nothing inside them changes, nothing around our environment changes. The conversation, the way Kendall put it, just keeps going. It's just one opinion versus the other. And until you actually spend the time to understand even the most divisive things that come out of people's mouth, why they're saying them, there's no real forward progress. You have to really understand why they feel that way. This was a tough one for me to, to put into a nutshell. Um, I'm going to start with the disclaimer that I treasure listening. I highly value listening, good listening, long, deep, intense listening, I think is very important. Um, but listening does have its, its limitations. I think that uh, li listening is a gateway to empathy. I think that listening is a gateway to um, problem solving. I think listening is a, a gateway to relationships, but that listening in and of itself does not inherently promise us any of those things. Um, I think about um, the power dynamic of the people who are listening uh, or discussing having these conversations with one another. Um, a drowning man and a man in a boat can have a great discussion about why they should or shouldn't let the drowning man in the boat. Um, but I feel like in that moment, maybe deep listening on both parts isn't you know, necessarily what we need. Um, I, I, I also think about um, communication as a skill. It's an exchange. Mm -hmm. And listening doesn't necessarily guarantee that the listener is interpreting the message um, the way it's being, that's in, it, with its intent. It doesn't say that the listener has an honorable intent in their listening or that the speaker is speaking with great clarity or accurate information or, um, or maybe perhaps honorable intent as well. I think that um, despite all of that, or maybe because of all of that, that's why relationship is so important. Hmm. Um, it's not just in the listening, it's in, it's why are we listening? And, and where are we going? What are we building with this listening? Um, there are many, what are, what are the problems that have been discussed for decades, centuries, that are still in existence, haven't, haven't really changed much over the years, despite all of the deliberation and, and deep listening? So um, I like to think of, um, I'm very pragmatic, I'm very practical, I like, I like things to go somewhere and I get very frustrated. Again, I highly value deep listening. And I highly value um, the warmth and the connection that comes from being heard. I think everybody needs that. I teach second grade, my students need that, their families need that, I need that. But at the same time, um, there's a place where listening has to go to a practical place and what do we do with that? Um, and so I think that relationship building and the intentional steps towards problem solving are very important as well. There's been an arc to what we've hoped to do here this evening. And as we kind of move to, uh, to our closing, my hope is that in our parting moments together that we embody perhaps what this arc has been. We started with some definitions and some engagement about hearing, listening, what that might be, what it might not be. And we find ourselves in this space where as much as we celebrate the gift and the skills that are associated with this thing that we have spent almost an hour engaging, there are some limitations. So as we get ready to depart from one another's physical and or live streaming presence, I want to invite us again to be in the here and the now. 
I want to invite us again to that moment of recognition that I spoke about at the beginning. The fact that we are here. We're here with one another. And I hope that we are here for one another. And I believe that there's wisdom in this space that I would like to capture. So I'm going to invite us into a moment of reflection now. And it's about the listening journey that we've been on for the last 45-ish minutes. I want you to begin thinking about what got your attention? What surprised you about something that was said? What may have comforted you when you heard a particular thought vocalized? What challenged you or even what tickled you? And for the next 75 seconds, I want you, I want us, to listen to ourself, capital S. And I want you to take stock of what gets your attention in this next now 65 seconds. What do you hear as you listen to yourself and you reflect on this journey that we've been on? And as you settle in on that most urgent thought, I want to invite you to write it down, perhaps on the note card that you got when you came in. Or if you have an electronic device that you can type it in, capture that most urgent thought, that wisdom from what this experience has been for you. What has your self, capital S, said to you? And here's where we hear the echo of teacher Margot Hall calling us to pragmatism. If you're feeling generous and perhaps even a bit courageous, I would like for you to either give me your note card that you wrote on before you go tonight or if you wrote something, typed something on your electronic device, send me an email with that wisdom. It's ingrammm at greenhill.org. And what I want to do is I want to take the wisdom 
that you so generously and courageously will share with me. And perhaps by the end of this academic year, your wisdom may have inspired a song that we might share about this notion of the art of listening and perhaps plural commons and what that might mean. So if you're feeling generous and courageous, get your wisdom to me. And as you're contemplating that, I also want to thank you very much for being with us this evening. And I hope that you experience this as a comma or a semicolon rather than a period. Uh, we have other initiatives and experiences for our community as we move forward. Uh, we will be collectively reading a search for common ground this year. Details about the pace of that, as well as the book gatherings that are on the horizon, those will be added to the Plural Commons web presence probably by early, uh, early October. If you have not ordered and have not secured your copy of the book, there are some copies that are available for, for you to take with you that are on the table outside. Uh, I also want to remind you that if you're interested in learning about someone in a deeper way, this academic year, you have until Thursday to sign up for a letter writing partner. And shortly after that, there will be some details and some norms that you'll get. And I also want to take this moment before we part from one another's presence to just celebrate our panelists. Will you help me celebrate them? Your applause helps make them feel better because some of them I needed to persuade quite a bit to say yes to, to this. So hopefully they feel much better about it at this point. I also want you to take a moment to celebrate yourselves for being present and for listening and engaging and for being courageous and giving me wisdom. There's that extra ask there. So celebrate yourselves. And as we get ready to go, in my partner's home country, they might say, Salani Khuchle, or go well. Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs>